Hi, Steve Van Meter here, and welcome to your weekly economic update, where we take about 30 minutes every Friday to try to make sense of markets you know, that really don't make any sense. And speaking of things that don't make any sense to me, I turned on a local uh, financial radio show, something I rarely listen to. I, I generally don't listen to other financial advisors, uh, just something I don't do. And in my opinion, the host made what I think is extremely ignorant statement when he said there was no economic risks or damages due to the coronavirus because the stock market was up that day. And it makes me wonder if that person knew that China is the world's largest exporter of goods. In their major cities, factories are being shut down due to fears of the coronavirus spreading. And that that is in itself a serious issue. And we want to talk about that. But first, I have a little trivia for you. Because the oil sector has been dropping. We see crude oil down to 51 a barrel and change. Uh, we're seeing oil company stocks get hammered, which if, if you're a regular watcher uh, or listener to my program, you kind of know that I've suggested based on the charting patterns and just general supply and demand that the risk to the oil stocks or energy stocks is to the downside. So here's a little bit of trivia for you, because I'm sure you've heard by now that international flights between major, well, almost everywhere to China are being canceled. Do you know how many barrels of oil it takes for a round trip flight? Take a guess. And while you're guessing, if you thought the number was 1,400 barrels per round trip flight, you are correct. I know, is that amazing? 1,400 barrels per flight. Now, the global economy is resilient to shocks. I mean, you can shake it, you can rattle it, you can spin it around, and you, you can even crack it a little bit. And sure, canceling one, one flight, you know, 1,400 barrels isn't really going to do a whole lot. But you start canceling a lot of flights at 1,400 barrels per flight times day after day after day after day when you're already seeing a rising trend in crude inventory and a rising trend in product bills such as gasoline or distillers. You say, well, wait a minute. You know, jet planes don't run on gasoline. Well, how do you think people get to the airport? How do you think things move around the airport? Well, you know, some of those vehicles do take gasoline. So the supply chain, I mean, think about that, taxis and shuttles and all the things that move around some of these airports, they're not going to need as many in China. And we do export gasoline to other places. So from a demand perspective, there's a reason we're seeing weakness, further weakness in crude oil and in oil and gas company stocks. Of course, it didn't hurt the narrative that ExxonMobil and Chevron reported earnings today and the market really didn't like them too much. But let's come back to this global supply chain. And it kind of makes me wonder if people really understand, and I've said this before, the issue isn't just the coronavirus. Let's just say it gets contained and you know the globe is shut down, you know, supply chains are shut down for another week or two. It's still the shutdown of supply chains that's a problem. You know, think about this, a factory in China that exports to the United States is closed right now. They were closed because of the holiday to begin with, and now people can't get to work. Do you think in China that people just get paid to sit at home? A lot of people in America do not get paid. Well, okay, I suppose if they're on uh, um, government assistance, but generally employees do not get paid to sit at home for weeks on end. Maybe they have vacation time, maybe they're sick time, but employers do not have an infinite amount of money. Say, so, oh, well, we're going to be closed for the next three or four weeks. Don't worry about it. You've got a full paycheck. A lot of people around this world work on an hourly rate and do not have savings, do not have the ability to buffer time off work. You say, well, why does that really matter? Because when you have a record amount of debt in the world and you have global debt growing faster than the global economy, eventually it becomes a problem. Now, you can do this for a long time, but there's a point where if the global economy isn't creating enough currency 
in dollars or regional currencies, depending on, on where you're at in the world, to pay on this debt, people default. And in a debt-based economy, if people start going into default, the whole thing grenades fast. So look at China. People aren't going to work. Factories aren't producing goods. Things are not being exported. Things are not being imported. You don't just flick a light switch one day and say, oh, hey, coronavirus is contained. Let's just turn the factory on. Oh, look, we're at 100% iPhone production, and that only took 30 seconds. No, you got to get your people back to work. Probably got to make sure they're not sick. You got to get your equipment checked out, turned on, make sure it's running properly, get every, all your supply chain. Well, wait a minute. What if you, the stuff that you need to manufacture is stuck somewhere where it, it can't get in? You have to wait till your trucks show up or your ships and all these other things. The global economy is very weak. You know, it's different when the global economy is really healthy and there's a shock, it can absorb it. But there's this notion that, hey, I'm sick, so I go to the doctor. The doctor prescribes uh, 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 some medicine. I t immediately take the medicine and I magically fix it and can go back to work. It's not how it works. Even if the coronavirus is contained tomorrow, the knock-on effects of the global economy shutting down were going to make their way to America. Just because on one day the stock market went up doesn't mean the next day, today, it wouldn't go down. Or maybe on Monday. It's going to affect profits, earnings, everything. And the longer this goes on and the worse it potentially gets, just from a supply chain issue, it's a problem because, again, there isn't enough money right now to pay on all the debts we have. There never is. But the Federal Reserve deliberately reduced the number of dollars in the global economy. And there is a massive amount of dollar-denominated debt, not to mention local currency debt, massive at record highs. So if there isn't dollars to pay on this debt, because things are shut down and people aren't getting those dollars. They go into delinquency, default, and party's over. You know, sometimes recessions don't just need, you know, something big to break. Sometimes they start by the domino tilting a little bit, like it is now, and then you get a little nudge, maybe from something like the coronavirus, and the next thing you know, zoom. You know, China's economy has been growing allegedly at 6% a year. What do you think is going to happen in the first quarter? It's going to be pretty ugly. You know, and here we are in the U.S., crude inventories are building, product inventories are building, and we haven't even seen the effects of the slowdown here yet. That We should start seeing that in the data next week. Do you think oil companies are going to be hiring people at 51 a barrel? We know, as a matter of fact, that most small producers are not profitable under 60. And the oil industry has a huge amount of debt that is due to start refinancing this year and over the next five years. At 51 a barrel, in, at risk going lower, which many people say is not going to happen, but the longer the shutdown, you know, things get shut down, yes, it will. The risk is the oil companies start laying off. Then what happens? Well, now you have more people out of work, less money flowing into the economy. It's a slippery slope. But nobody is discussing world dollar liquidity. What is the if, so what is if you if you're tuning in for the very first time watching this video, you're like I have Stephen no idea what world dollar liquidity is. What that is is this is the Bretton Woods Agreement that made the U.S. dollar the global reserve currency. And when we went off the gold standard, the dollar became the gold standard. So if you want to buy oil, crude oil in another country, you're paying in dollars. When you export to the United States, you get dollars in return. It is the U.S. dollars Greece global trade. And it also is what is used to pay on a lot of debts because a lot of people, even in foreign countries, borrow in dollars. Well, what do you, how do you pay a dollar to on a loan? You pay it in dollars. You don't pay it with euros. You don't pay it with renminbi or anything like that. So let's look at world dollar liquidity now with the world's largest exporter shut down. And the amount of debt in China is massive. We, to what extent, we don't know, but we do know corporations there are massively over leveraged but let's take a look at how this functions from world dollar liquidity standpoint. So here we go. Consumers buy foreign goods. Well, wait a minute. That's a problem because what's going on? Can we, you know, if it's not already on ships or anything, it may not be coming anytime soon. 
and so from so we so consumers buy foreign goods. I think I actually might have these arrows going the wrong way. Um, uh, anyways, dollars flow. That happens sometimes. Dollars flow to foreign companies because when f- consumers buy foreign goods, what are they paying? U.S. dollars. That when things again get shipped to the United States, they are paid in dollars. Foreign companies get dollars, they exchange them to their foreign central bank for local currency. They may go through their regional bank, but it gets to the foreign central bank. The foreign central bank buys U.S. Treasury securities, and those get uh, that money goes back into the U.S. government's hands, who spends it out in the real economy. And probably if we had the arrows going the other direction, this would make a whole lot more sense. So here's the problem. Dollars are not flowing to foreign companies. So what is going to happen to world dollar liquidity? It is going to contract even further than the Fed has already contracted it. So it's going to shrink. And what does that mean when world dollar liquidity shrinks to the global economy? It's got to shrink to meet it. It's got to bring asset prices down, stock prices down, and whatnot. That is a huge, huge risk. So, all right, let's get on to the, uh, whoops, the normal charts we look at. Talk about the M2 money supply. Uh, growth rate is up 7.14% from a year ago. So we're seeing the money supply rise. Six month rate of change is rising. Three month rate of change is rising. But what is driving that is not what you want at this stage in the game. And what is driving it is money flowing into savings deposits. You can see the increase from the preceding period, uh, which is last week and now. And you can also see an increase in institutional money funds. This is referring to brokerage accounts. So, you know, IRAs, 401ks, things like that. You're seeing an increase there. When money goes into cash, it's not flowing around the real economy. And that is uh, pushes interest rates down. Now, let's take a look at the assets and liabilities at commercial banks, and then we'll come back to our other charts. So we see securities and bank credit that increased six billion, with most of it being in mortgage-backed securities. Now, one something that nobody's really talking about either is we've seen this sharp jump in refinances, which I said will help push interest rates down because people go from 15 years, you know, 20-year loans back to 30. That puts demand on banks issuing 30-year loans. And guess what you need when you have 30-year mortgages on your book? You need uh, matching uh, maturity capital such as 30-year U.S. Treasury bonds. So you have banks needing then to buy longer-term bonds, brings interest rates down. It would work a lot. You see interest rates go up if there was a, a large demand in new purchases, and there isn't a huge demand in that. So as we look at this, one thing we're, we're not seeing directly is when you see a big increase in refinances, you know, you got to remember the Federal Reserve owns like two thirds of all mortgages and they want to get rid of them. They're still selling off 20 billion a month of mortgages from their balance sheet and replacing them with U.S. Treasury securities. On the other side of the coin, though, is those are going to the banks on top of the fact that as people refi, if the Fed, I mean, there's two, two, two thirds out of every refi probably is going from the Fed balance sheet to the bank, putting pressure on the banks to add more collateral. So that's important uh, from you know, the banks being allowed to, to lend and do other things. So here you can see mortgage-backed securities uh, jumped uh, 13 billion last week. They shed two billion of treasury securities and other securities were r- relatively flat. Loans and leases at all commercial banks rose. One thing that probably did help is Boeing did take, I don't know if it's going to show this week or next week, but Boeing did take out 12 billion in loans. And so we see an increase here in 4 billion. Uh, obviously, there are going to be you know loans that are defaulting. There are payments being made against principal that do reduce this number. But so not a huge amount of growth there. There's some growth over last week, but not a huge amount of growth over prior months. Real estate loans rose uh, looks like seven billion. So we've seen we're seeing some you know loan growth here for sure. You know nine uh, so twenty billion in overall loan growth, but the economy is still fairly weak. And uh, let's, let's go back to this. And I suspect as interest rates go down, financial conditions tighten, banks tighten their purses, 
and we should expect to see loan growth continue to slow. So real estate loans still flat at three, roughly 3.79% from last year. Lower mortgage rates are not translating into huge amounts of real estate demand. The six month rate of change is flat. Three month rate of change is flat. Nothing going on there. Commercial industrial loan uh, growth rate is flat at 1%. Hasn't really gone anywhere in the last couple of weeks. The six month rate of change has increased slightly, but the three month rate of change is still flat. But these are both in negative, showing negative growth in lending. And that's not good for a debt based economy. And 1% growth is not good uh, at all. And looking at total loans and leases at all commercial banks, representing one third of all the loans in the US economy, growth rate is flat at 3.89% from last year, which is very weak historically. The six month rate of change is at 1.55 rising slightly and the three month rate of change is 0.6 percent and rising slightly uh, look breaking down at consumer loans credit cards growing at 4.72 percent which is fairly weak for them and uh, will i suspect that will roll over as people are out of work and uh, production slows down obviously you know things coming out of china affect jobs and businesses here uh, the copper gold ratio suggests lower treasury yields. Well, that definitely did happen today for sure. And then I thought this was interesting. Uh, this is fund managers, average cash balance as a percentage versus the S&P 500. And this, I noted that fund managers start out the year with the lowest level of cash in over a decade. So, you know, for a, a market perspective, people are all in. And you'd be like, well, stocks are going to go up. You got to understand, people are all in. They don't own a lot of bonds. They should, but they don't. Let's take a look at some charts. Uh, in fact, we'll probably just spend uh, the rest of our time digging through these in ahead of Monday, which we'll take a look at um, the hedge, hedge fund manager position, which is really interesting uh, as we look at where everyone is sitting at the moment. So the S&P 500 gave back all of its gains for uh, 2020 and is slightly negative on the year. The NASDAQ, thanks to Amazon's earnings last night, remains in positive territory. The Dow, definitely negative on the year. Small caps, very negative compared to the other three on the year. And what did we say uh, a couple days ago? When volatility crosses a 200-day moving average and, and confirms it, it usually indicates that volatility is rising. We're seeing volatility start to move up here off of it's 200 day moving average. Let's take a look at treasury yields. Five year treasury yields are right at a pretty critical support for five year yields. And let's zoom out a little bit. Um, actually, let's go a little bit farther and then we'll zoom this in so you can see it. And you can see five year treasury yields, very uh, major support level here, right at 1.3%. And that if broken, suggests that five-year yields are headed back down near their 2016 lows, somewhere around 1%. And we can see that's the next, you know, the, there's some support here at 1.12, and then from there, we're down to one. And from a risk perspective, keep in mind, the lower bound of the federal funds rate is 1.5%. So five-year treasuries are inverted. Seven-year, not shown here, inverted. That is not a sign of a healthy economy. 10-year treasury yields closed at 1.51. This is, again, this closes uh, 30 minutes early. I don't know why, but it does. It closed at 1.51%. Again, the federal funds rate is at 1.5. So the 10-year treasury is about to invert. And what did a Fed speaker say today? Oh, they think that the inversion is not a big deal because it has more to do with things in China than the US economy, which they believe is healthy until the Fed has to have emergency rate cuts because the nearly entire treasury yield curve is inverted. And you can see that when 10-year treasuries have their next major support right around 1.4%, if broken, you're going to see the largest topping pattern in treasury 10-year treasury yields break. And that suggests that not only will the Fed be forced to cut, but 10-year treasury yields are going to fall to zero and bring the entire bond market or the entire stock market with it as bonds make new all-time highs. And you can see it broke this wedge pattern here. And what happened is people that were short were forced out. Um, but based on the trading volume, we don't see them such in dire situation. But anyways, we're now bite back at our October lows from last year with the all-time lows just in sight. 
30-year Treasury the same way, broke below and uh, closed under 2%, so this is inaccurate, closed below their October lows and are now right, you know, staring one, all-time lows at 1.905%. And here you have also a huge topping pattern as well. This one goes back also to, um, you can see 2012, big bottoming, you know, lower low, lower low, lower low, floor goes out, 30-year treasury yields, I believe head to 1% or less, big, big move for the bond market. Let's take a look at the ETFs that match these. We don't, we haven't looked at IEF in a while, uh, but I said this was a, a consolidation pattern that would lead to higher bond prices. And here you see IEF right near its all-time highs. So that will have to break all-time highs in order for 10-year treasury yields to get down to their all-time lows at 1.4. Let's look at TLT, which is one of the largest traded ETFs in the bond market. This represents 20 plus year maturity bonds. And here you can see, again, I said this triangle pattern uh, based on the old uh, technical analysis book says, hey, when you get a major bottom, a rise in price, a long triangle pattern like this, it usually means prices are headed higher and look how quickly they moved up and they erased all of this drop from October and are staring right back at this major resistance level on this purple line. Now this purple line is pretty important because once you get through here, it tells you there's not a lot of resistance left uh, for sellers up here. Now, how do we know that? You can look at the volume and we can see that selling started up here, but it really didn't get going until down in here. And, and when you see selling occur, you see the volume kind of moved up a bit and as it peaked, this was a computer program. So those quant computers that I talk about, when bond prices went up, they would sell and drive them down. You see, then it went up what happened? Volume went up, they sold. And then prices went up, volume went up, they sold. Prices went up, volume went up, they sold. Prices went up, they sold, and now they ran out of gas and boom, off to the races because the smart money is sitting on bond. And you're talking about a bull market breakout coming real soon here in the bond market because here is the 20 year historical on this ETF and I don't believe it goes in. Yeah, this is the whole historical on this ETF. So bond prices, are right near their all-time high with nothing but blue sky ahead and still a very, very short market of bonds. And people just don't own them. And another factor to think about, you know, major, uh, very large pension funds have been selling volatility to make a yield because uh, interest rates are too low for them, meaning they're short the bond market. And they're short also by shorting volatility, which is really complex and sounds really good until the whole thing blows up in your face. So as bonds continue to rally and interest rates go down, pension funds are gonna to have to buy volatility to unwind these massive bond shorts. It's going, they're gonna to have to sell stocks to cover. And when you get selling, be get selling and the whole thing unwinds. And so what you look at and see in this chart is all these people that were short are out of ammunition. Now, if we zoom in on today's action, you get a really good indicator of this resistance level because you see bond prices rose up, hit resistance, sellers came in. <clears throat> so what you're looking for is the how strong the selling hand is. So then prices went up, sellers came back in, prices went up, and then sellers kind of were exhausted, prices rallied. Look at how quick they rallied up. Sellers came in and said, nope, slammed it down, prices came back. So what you're seeing is sellers or, or, you know, they're, they're showing, you know, strength here on these rapid moves down, but they're running out of ammunition. Prices went up, tried to break out, tried to break out, selling, boom, and then came back right before close. And so you give you an idea that this is going to break. And when this breaks, people that are short are going to have to start buying. And you can look at this volume. Let's say we go back two years. You see, okay, the volume's rising compared to this low period here, but it's certainly not big volume like we've seen. Let's go back even further. And you can see there's periods of much larger volume that's being traded. So there's still a lot, an entire market that is short bonds. And when bonds break in, into a bull market, there will be people that play chase because that is what US investors do. They, buy, they don't buy low, they buy high, they play chase and you've got a lot of computerized programs that are gonna notice this momentum rising. Now, the last thing I saw, and this is not current, uh, it's probably more than a month ago, 
that I read that the quant computer programs of all of the things that are trading, computer programs that are trading the market won't be back until yields get below 1.5 on the 10 year treasury. Well, what are they at? 1.51. Now wait till those things come back in and start buying and you literally have a lot of fuel that could just drive interest rates down and bond prices straight up. And that's why this happens because people are short the market. All right, so I think we've uh, covered bonds pretty well. Let's take a look at the ags real quick because remember I said I, I felt there's a little more selling that needed to come down here because we're about to form a here's your left shoulder, here's your head, here's a right shoulder forming. And if you think, well, well there's, there's plenty of food. Well, go look up the locust swarm. The largest locust swarm in 70 years is ravishing its way through Africa. And, you know, granted, we do not import probably a lot of food from Africa. They're going to be a place that needs food. And remember, uh, we have food, uh, not as much as we should because our harvest wasn't as great as it needed to be. But, you know, what do you think is going to happen in China when, you know, things or production is shut down? I mean, everything is shut down. So this is the I believe that we should see. Uh, DBA kind of come to a stop here, probably, you know, pretty soon around uh, 15 and a half. That would form your right shoulder. And then from there, we've got a major neckline sends prices way up. Let's take a look at some oil stocks. Uh, let's look at Chevron. Again, I'm not picking on any particular company. These two are just the, the largest positions in the energy, largest energy ETF symbol XLE. And you can see here was this uh, triangle pattern. And I said, what would happen at some point prices would break down and they would end up selling because all these people that have bought Chevron up here would turn into sellers and you're starting to see that. So the next level of support for Chevron stock is around 103. After that, you're down to a little under 100. And from there, you're kind of back to your 26, uh, 2015, 20, uh, early 2016 lows pretty quick. How about Exxon Mobil? Largest topping pattern in the energy sector, 12 year topping pattern. Broke 60 down to 62 today is back where it was in 2010. And support for Exxon is around 60. If it doesn't hold 60, uh, this thing can easily get down into, you know, f low $40 a barrel real fast and even lower as people that bought all the way up here turn into sellers. And if we, we can see that mirror on XLE, here it is, the largest ETF, 40% of it split between, not quite equally between uh, Chevron and Exxon. And you can see there it's breaking support at 55. I said, watch 55. Its next level of support is gonna be right here around 52, close to 53. Um, and if it doesn't hold there, this thing is gonna come somewhere down here, probably around 45. And if it can't hold there, it's, its next move is down here in the 30s. And that is dangerous for the oil sector because there's so much debt in the oil sector. This coronavirus is just bad timing. Here is symbol XOP. So this is a small oil and gas producers ETF, all time low today. This thing is likely headed to zero or close to zero. Could be a big opportunity at that time to buy some of these energy companies up pretty cheap. It would be pretty risky, but this chart is suggesting those things go to zero. Um, uh, ETFs don't actually go to zero because they'll just cut off the low performers. But look at crude oil. It closed at 51 and changed today. Its major support is at 50 right now. Break 50 and you're back down to the 43. And I can tell you most oil companies are not profitable. And, you know, we talked about, was it last week, that big short position that Oxy put out or a couple weeks ago, maybe, and how traders made fun of them. Yeah, Oxy doesn't look too dumb now, do they? You know, there's a reason major oil producers are the smart money. And I've been telling you for a while that major oil company executives are selling stock. It's not inside information I have, it's public record. But look, these guys and gals know what's going on. So gasoline inventory is all time high. And I suspect we'll start seeing build after build after build as long as they starting next week, as long and we've been seeing builds, but I think they will get bigger due to the coronavirus. But crude oil is just in an ugly place. And that is not good for small oil and gas producing companies and even probably even mid-sized ones. So expect to see layoffs announced out of the energy sector because it's coming. So uh, that will be our update for today. 
you know, so a lot of things to watch. Keep an eye on the coronavirus because as longer things are shut down, there's a lot of risk to this economy. And um, all of a sudden you'll watch people will be forced to sell out of stocks as the bond market rallies and the big bull market and bonds is close. I said this would happen. And when it does, it's going to take bond prices straight up. It's going to cause a big repricing of equities because there's a dollar shortage. Remember, you know, if you're short bonds, you have to go buy the bond. Well, how do you get it? You need cash. What if you don't have cash? Well, you got to sell stocks. But if you're short volatility and short the bond market, when you sell your stocks, volatility goes up. So now you're getting hammered on your bond shorts and your volatility shorts. So you got to sell more stocks to cover your vol shorts, which cause volatility to rise. And as bond prices rise, you get, keep selling stocks to cover your bond shorts. Look, this happens every time. And then the dollar starts going higher because there's a quick, all of a sudden there's an immediate demand for do dollars worldwide. There already is, dollars already rising. What does that do to energy stocks and gold? Why do you think we're seeing a replay of what happened during the, on the onset of the great financial crisis? Everyone's like, gold, 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 gold. And what happened? It went down because the dollar kicked off. And why would people sell gold? Because they don't want to sell their stocks. So at some point they're like, man, I'll sell my gold to cover my vol, you know, my, my bond shorts and maybe my other positions. And then when things start unwinding too quick, you know, the party is over. And this is all close to really happening. And who would have thought the coronavirus could be what tips the domino over? I'm Steve Van Meter. Thanks for watching. I'll see you Monday. Bye now. The content of this video is provided as educational information only. It's not intended to provide investment or other advice to not to be construed as a recognition or solicitation by or selling security, financial instrument, or participate in any particular trading strategy. This video was prepared by Stephen Van Meter on personal capacity. Opinions expressed in the video that I do not reflect the view of Atlas Financial Advising or Stephen Van Meter Financial.